Okay. Right. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben. My name is Ben Loomer, and this is my colleague, Catherine Dimas. And we are here to talk to you about, uh, you know, talking about the history of English-speaking communities and the impact on the sense of belonging. And um, both Catherine and I work at the Community Learning Centers, which is a network of community schools. We'll talk about more of that in a second. And um, before we start, I always like to introduce myself. So prior to working with the Community Learning Centers, I was a high school teacher. Uh, here in Montreal with the English Montreal School Board, where I taught secondary one, two, three, English language arts, uh, history, geography, phys ed, and ethics and religious culture. Uh, and I uh, used to work as a community development agent, or a CLC coordinator, as we used to be known. Uh, so that meant that I was working in a school in Ville, in Ville, Ville Saint Laurent, uh, and I will explain a little bit more what exactly that means, because you've heard CLCs, community learning centers, a few times. Some of you may be familiar with them. Some of you might be wondering, what the heck are these people talking about? We will explain. Um, before that, though, I was working as a community develop. Uh, I was working as a um, technology integration specialist. This did not have a name when I was doing this job for about 10 years in the schools. I was helping teachers integrate media and technology into the curriculum in a way that helped give students a voice. So, fancy title, um, but really got to work in the schools, uh, which is why we're really excited, uh, Ben and I, to share some of this with you because we can give you a bit of that perspective from, from inside the school. We'll give you, we'll give you the scoop. So one thing I should just uh, warn you a little bit is that unlike other presentations we've been seeing, uh, there's going to be a bunch of uh, opportunities for us to talk together and plan different ways and share what's been happening in our own schools and communities. So uh, that's really important that we get to know each other a little bit. Uh, so very quickly, I'd like to kind of pass the microphone around and people just introduce yourself, perhaps where you're from and what uh, kind of your role which brought you to this, uh, this great conference. So I will start here. Okay, hi, my name is Diane. I'm a lawyer and a plain language specialist with Educalois. I don't know how many of you uh, know about Educalois. Okay, great, so I don't have to explain it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Brian Rock, uh, Quebec Federation of Home and Schools. Carol Mindel, Quebec Federation of Home and Schools, and we had a project called Family Treasures where we asked children to bring to school, write an essay about an object that meant something to their family. And it often had a lot to do with grandparents coming over from another country and immigration and holding on to culture. So I was very interested in this particular workshop. I'm Steffi De, and I'm a PhD student at Concordia working on intangible heritage. So it's not more to this, but I don't. Thank you. We like to invite everyone to participate. This is Scott Fleming, uh, Youth for Youth Quebec, Y for Y Quebec. Um, uh, my educational background is in history, uh, even though I'm working with a non as the director of this nonprofit. My educational background, I did my PhD in history, so a good overlap between some of my areas of interest. My name is Angelina Lego. I represent uh, Vision Gaspe Percy now and the Gaspe Literacy Council. Um, yeah, but I, I, I also have a, a personal interest mm -hmm. in um, in history and in um, anthrop anthropology as well. So I, I've done, you know, research in the area where I'm from. So uh, yeah, I'm interested in seeing how this is gonna. Uh, my name is Anne Robineau. Uh, je suis sociologue, chercheur à l'Institut Canadien de Recherche sur les minorités linguistiques. Je suis une collègue de Lorraine, ou est-ce Rémi? <laughs> Dan Lamoureux, I'm president of the Quebec English School Board Association and chair at the Riverside School Board. 
Danielle Azoulay. I work with the, the Department of Canadian Heritage. I work under the Official Languages Support Programs. And uh, most of the, pro the funding that we deliver in the region uh, is linked to community vitality of the English-speaking communities. And we see it a lot uh, go towards projects or programming that are linked to the vitality and includes the history, the rich and diverse history of the community. Hi, I'm Eva Ludwig, and I'm a, a volunteer member of a Quebec Community Groups Network. I'm on the board and the executive. And prior to that, I'm now retired, which is why I can volunteer. Um, I worked for um, 20 years as the Quebec representative for the Commissioner of Official Languages. So my interest in the English-speaking community is obvious. Hello, my name is Annalise Jensen. I work for the Secretariat uh, to uh, Quebecer to relations with uh, English-speaking Quebecers. Sorry, I'm, it's a long title. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hi, Dulce Maria Cruz Herrera. So, uh, Secretaria en relation avec les Québécois que sont anglaises from the Quebec government. Okay, so. Uh, like we said in the beginning, and to reiterate for our newcomers, Ben and I are, uh, we work at LEARN, and LEARN is an educational nonprofit. We serve the English speaking community. Um, we do a lot of great things, and we have uh, three distinct teams. We have our virtual campus, uh, we have the pedagogical services teams that works very closely with teachers, and we have the provincial resource team, PRT, more, more acronyms. Um, no, wait, I just learned. It's not an acronym, it's a, it's an initial. It's an initial, because we don't say <laughs> uh, Yes, so we, um, we offer support to the community learning centers. And what is a community learning center? It's not a place, like the name would suggest. It's not a person. Like we often hear, if you've worked with CLCs, you'll know the name of a person. There are a few uh, of the community development agents here. Rather, it's an approach. It's an approach to community vitality, to educational success, and it has that dual mandate. So we've heard a lot about that, educational success, lifelong learning, um, mobilizing the community in support of student success, and also mobilizing the schools in support of community vitality. I won't go on and on. We've heard this over and over. Um, one of the things I do want to show you is this beautiful graph. And it's just a very simple illustration of the role of the community development agent as a liaison or as a person that has one foot in the school and one foot in the community. These are key people. They work with the school principals. Their role is to figure out what's needed in the school, along with the help of the staff, and also go into the community, figure out what's needed in the community for the students, for their families, how they can create mutually beneficial relationships and partnerships. So we're gonna have some very specific illustrations of this. And the other wonderful thing that we've seen in the educational policy is this quote, which I always love to read out very, very slowly. Education is a collective effort in which the general public must participate. Parents and community stakeholders and partners must be mobilized in the spirit of cooperation and accountability. This shows up in the policy. This is very powerful. This is something that a lot of us have been working towards for a long time, and it's now recognized. So, yay. Okay, where are these CLCs? Where do you find them? We have a beautiful map on our website, uh, and you can see they're a little bit everywhere, from all the way from Val d'Or to the Magdalen Islands. So they are, we are in um, all of the school boards, so the nine English school boards, the one special status, and we are in uh, one private school as well. There are 86 schools to date that are CLC schools that adopt the CLC 
the community school approach, and we have 48 community development agents that support the schools. Okay, enough about us. Uh, we are going to show you some examples from these schools. And to tell you more, here's Ben Loomer. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so one thing which I want to kind of place in your mind as we go through some examples of um, projects which uh, allow students to explore their own local history and heritage, I want to just share with you the notion or the importance of school community partnerships. So all the examples I'm going to show you, all the examples of books that are floating around the room, are, uh, couldn't have happened with just a school. They happen with schools and community organizations or schools and seniors groups working together um, to help explore and allow students to go deeper into their own history and heritage. Uh, and this is something that's really important because uh, one thing which we're going to kind of shift through uh, a little bit later in our presentation is this opportunity for um, the people in the room to brainstorm some different ideas of projects that might work in your own context. And one thing which I want to um, emphasize over and over again is the importance of partnerships and collaboration and ways that you see yourself being able to work with the school to help uh, make some of these great things happen. So um, one thing which I also want to highlight or, or place in your mind as we move forward is kind of thinking about um, the challenge or the authentic need that a lot of these projects um, work towards and that is creating opportunities for youth to explore where they came from to know where they're going. Uh, and this uh, is something which is, I think, strongly connected to the curriculum in different ways. This opportunity for young people to read, write, and produce um, their own stories and the stories of their um, parents and grandparents um, and beyond. So we'll be continuing, or we'll be coming back to this in a few moments. So the first uh, example I want to share with you is something called Seas for Coast. The, the book is floating around the room somewhere. Um, and basically, uh, as you may or may not know, if you can kind of picture in your mind's eye the lower north shore of Quebec. It's where Labrador and Quebec touch. So this is a very unique region which is um, isolated from the rest of Quebec. There's not um, easily, it's not easily accessible except by boat or by plane. And one thing, as you can imagine, in this isolated area is they have their own uh, vocabulary, their own, um, oh my gosh, what's the right word? Like dialect of English in a way. Um, so they have these terms which they themselves as a community need to celebrate. So what um, parents, teachers, uh, volunteers put together was how can we preserve our dialect, our own special words, and put it into an early literacy book that uh, people can read to the young people. Um, and so as you look at this book, you'll see great illustrations by students um, which talk about these, these certain types of words. Uh, and it's really a great way to celebrate history and heritage um, as they, of course, become part of the 21st century where, where many of these words have the potential to be lost. This book, which was published and is available on Amazon, uh, is something which uh, is really wonderful um, and has made a lasting impact over the last two or three years since it's been published. This is another uh, example of a project which came from Quebec High School, the Central Quebec, High, uh, Central Quebec um, School Board. And this was uh, in collaboration with some different community partners as well, as wanting young people to have the opportunity to uh, explore the great history of Quebec City, but make it accessible to English-speaking population and tourists who don't speak French. So uh, young people were uh, given the challenge of like, what is an authentic need in your community? And they're like, you know what? We have American tourists that come and visit our town, our, our city, but they, uh, we as fluent English speakers in high school can um, ensure that they have a, a guide as they walk around the city, uh, and it's really well done. Um, and something I encourage you to look at as well. This is another project from the Lower North Shore of Quebec. So again, as you can imagine, uh, in this isolated region, they have their own um, culture and cuisine. So this was just a very, um, this is part of a project around promoting health and well-being. And the idea that uh, young people should speak to their grandparents and speak to their parents and find out like what is a typical or traditional um, dish that uh, our family is proud of. And the like kindergarten to grade three students um, created these cookbooks. Uh, and as a English language arts teacher, like the process of them uh, speaking to people, writing and producing a book uh, is very much connected to the curriculum, but it's also like themselves speaking to people that are part of their English speaking community uh, and, and preserving it 
Um, and as you can imagine, part of this class as well, which is part of health and well-being, was them cooking the food and then sharing it with the community um, in, a, in a collective meal. Uh, this is a story um, from James Link High School, which is in the southwest of Montreal. Uh, this is um, a really great teacher. His name is Nathan Gage, who over the last three or four years has done really amazing projects with the 15-plus uh, program. Uh, and again, this is another example of a project that happens with uh, school community partners. So um, they brought in um, people interested in um, graffiti art, well, to take, back, take a step back, this organization's been working with partners uh, to turn themselves into a urban art school. So what that means in different cases is bringing in, for example, hip hop artists that were part of the English language arts program called R Word, Writing Our Rhymes Down. Uh, and this small project kind of evolved into students wanting to know more about their community. Um, and they took an old book room in the library that was just filled with dusty books, and they cleaned it out and they turned it into a, a space, uh, an art space, where they have um, a different a vernissage once or twice a year, which allows and brings the community in to uh, see some of the different art that's been done with students and with partners involved with students as well. And every year they kind of find themselves on the front page of the Montreal Gazette. Um, and this last year, um, what they did was basically they taught students how to interview people uh, in the community and learn about the lives of the Southwest of Southwest Montreal. And so if you go into their website, you um, learn about different people in the community, and there's uh, interviews that you can click on and, um, and learn more about like a wide range of people, ranging from famous like Oliver Jones, a very famous uh, penis in the black community, to um, people involved in different um, local projects. So it's something very exciting and something, a model that in many ways can be replicated uh, in the different communities. So this other um, example I want to show you with you is a project that was done in Danville, which is in the Eastern Township School Board. And um, we had a teacher who essentially had the students go in grade five and six, like interview seniors and learn about the history of their town. So this is where I'm going to kind of um, switch gears a little bit and just share that this is a good, this is a good, this is a great project. But in many ways, I want to kind of challenge the people in the room here to think about how they could make it an amazing project. Uh, so as we say sometimes, like go from good to great. Um, and think about as community partners in different realms, how you might be able to collaborate with teachers and with schools to, to make some really wonderful things happen. Um, and I have a very small clip that I just wanted to show you just to um, just give you a small taste of it. But you know, things that we've learned is that A, producing a film is like very, very difficult. So this teacher took on an immense amount of work by himself. Um, so that's one thing that he kind of did um, out of his own time. But also, um, you know, it, just small issues like sound uh, are important. So what are ways that different community partners can say, like, oh, this is one thing that we could help you with? So it's, it's quite short. It's just a minute and a half. I, I edited it. But uh, just let's just take a look. Of all the Marys, my granddaughter Mary, um, a very nice young French Canadian who will be dead, and now I have a great grandson. Cool. So isn't that nice? Uh -huh. That's great. Yes. I actually live in the Yellow Vandal city, and my main language is very English. Mm -hmm. That's good. Change the most about 
So that, I mean, just a very small example of this film that these grade five and six students put together. They um, had a, like a, a movie launch and the whole community came out, not the whole community, but like a good amount of people came out and um, got to celebrate what young people had done and the, the seniors in the community that had uh, kind of shared their stories. So uh, I just see that as, of course, a small example of what is possible out there. So um, we're gonna switch gears in a second, but I wanted to just ask if there's any questions before we move on. Great, okay. So what's gonna happen now is uh, we wanna kind of brainstorm some ideas. So Catherine's going to pass around some post-its um, I do either, uh, you know, three post-its or so. Um, you can have more if you have more ideas. But in the notion of brainstorming, don't be too constrained by um, by what is possible or, or you know, it's just, just the kind of the first ideas that are coming through your mind. But one idea per post-it, I would like you to write down um, what are what is an idea or question that can contribute to creating opportunities for youth to explore where they came from, to know where they're going. So what are some ideas um, or questions or notions that uh, you can think about in your own experience and where you're at that, uh, that can create opportunities for, for youth to explore their own history and heritage, where they came from and where they're going? Are there any questions about what you need to be doing right now with your ideas? And I will stop talking and give you uh, three or four minutes to write that down. Thank you. Okay, so uh, keep writing, obviously, if you uh, have more stuff to write down. Um, what I'm hoping we can do right now is kind of quickly, not quickly, we have time, to go and people can say what is their idea on their post-it. And this is, this is the method that I like to use, is that as we, people kind of read out one idea at a time, we're gonna put it on our, our whiteboard over here. And then as we kind of go through, I'm assuming, that we're gonna start seeing some themes, um, some different kind of ideas that are common to each other. Um, and we'll kind of group them together and we'll, we'll give them a name at some point. And that will lead us to the next part of our workshop. So um, just to make it clear, so what we'll do is I'm gonna ask one of you to please just read out one idea at a time. Um, and then we'll uh, put them on a board and see where it goes from there. Do I have a volunteer to go first? Yes, please. Scott, I'm gonna pass you the mic as well. And we'll do one at a time, and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of loop around until we run out of ideas. Uh, the first thing that came to my head was, um, I find archives are often uh, an underutilized resource. And maybe uh, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe uh, one thing that could be done is design some sort of project around a question that you could solve uh, by uh, using archival sources. So kids get to learn um, about how to problem solve and use the different resources, put together uh, the answers to a question based on the traces left behind in the past. Um, oh, I'll take the first one. Okay. Um, and probably just because I can't help it, I'm probably just gonna name like links to the curriculum as you say that. So one thing Well, I have an idea that is on a related note to that. Um, I thought one thing we could do is explore, um, encourage exploration of 
those groups and individuals who are not as well known in local histories. So where I'm from, we're a very homogenous community. So to encourage, you know, who are the underdogs of our, our history and then to encourage exploration of that. I'm sorry. Uh, it was about the archives too. So, uh, what can I add? Uh, maybe to. I, I saw this experience in New Brunswick and the French community. Uh, so, uh, it was. Uh, there were some people who post uh, photos on Facebook uh, about uh, historical. Uh, Sites and so uh, you you people discovers uh, discover these uh, photos and ask about that. So it maybe it, it's a, it's a kind of <laughs> yeah uh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, we'll do what we call in the business popcorn style. So if you want to just say it, just raise your hand. Something probably very simple but the idea of exploring their own roots uh, through building a family tree. Okay, great. Great, so we have, fa we have a couple, couple family tree, great. I'm just giving you time to catch up. Uh, it's in the same vein. Um, ask youth to document the diverse origins, meaning place, ethnicity, and so on of people in their English-speaking community. In other words, dig down into what's behind that. I think this is essentially um, a less detailed version of what Scott said. Um, basically, we can ask young people to read local newspapers um, and to see to glean from them how life was in the past and compare it with the way life is today. Well, sort of in the same idea of what she just said, I was thinking sort of my old idea of family treasures, but asking them to ask members of their family to describe to them a favorite Christmas present that they had. So if they were to ask their grandparents, it might be a very different sort of thing. Or even if they can remember what their great-grandparent maybe really treasured as a child, it would also give a sense of history and how culture has changed. Anyone else like to share something? Um, my idea was uh, through through how the environment changes. For example, maybe Montreal. Um, there is big events that happen that change the landscape. Expo '67, but it can go back and back. And I remember walking on McGill College, and there's pictures of Montreal in the 1900s. And could be a way to explore different communities, different areas where different communities set up. Yeah. And behind the uh, family, creating a family tree, you have to give them the resources, specifically access to a uh, computer and, and different sites that you can check your genealogy and, and break it off like that. Yep, absolutely. In uh, some remote regions where it's still possible to uh, create occasions for intergenerational workshops on traditional trades that are at risk of loss. And uh, we've seen that done in the Magdalenian Islands and in some other regions, but it's, it's a way to, to, to keep some trades alive or at least transmitted uh, in some way. Um, and to go back to the neighborhoods, also if the youth is able to explore its neighborhood and uh, a way also to capture is to, to draw the buildings that represent their community and to write upon the history of those buildings. Um, so walking <coughs> tours, podcasts of their neighborhoods. Absolutely. Um, 
just to go a little bit in a different vein, because I think another part of the question was if we can have some questions mm. that we want to, and a question that I thought would be interesting in terms of having them reflect on their future, thinking forward. Do you think it's important to speak English in Quebec? And why or why not? So another question in the same vein. Uh, ask youth to depict what they think their English-speaking community will look like in 50 years, and, and more specifically, why? Thank you. Um, it's not really an idea per se for a project, but maybe an approach to take that you could use with many of these different projects. I was thinking uh, some sort of cross-cultural uh, research exchange where an English-speaking and a French-speaking uh, school collaborate to do the same project and maybe uh, pair up or switch sides because uh, by doing that, they'd really get a, a unique perspective on how uh, the other side sees history and uh, their place within the community. perfect uh, segue. Uh, I'm from the Ministry of Education. I've just been there less than two months, but I, uh, one of the projects I have is a Programme d'échange linguistique intra-Québec, Approche Nouvelle, Pelican. Isn't that clever? <laughs> so yeah, we are funding uh, exactly what you just mentioned, uh, exchanges between English and French school boards. And I'm, yeah. And we've got a, quite a few from Littoral all of a sudden, so. Yeah, and we cover most travel expenses and substitution uh, for the teachers. So, yeah, look us up. We have a website, which is out there. Thank you. No, thank you. And also say that on the flip side of Pelican is Facet, which is uh, between English and French in the same school. So, um, Any other ideas, questions, notions to share before we move on to the next part? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll go here, and then we'll go back. Is that okay? Um, ask youth to describe what English commu English speaking community means, but they're not allowed to use the w the definition of speaking English. Okay, I'm taking off my ministry cap and going back to. I'm also a former teacher, but I love the idea of the Christmas present. I think for smaller, well, any age children, bring in, bringing in objects, if you can get your hands on them, right? And making them guess what they might have been used for. And especially if they're related to any industry that was from the past in a, yeah. Like an A-track player. Um, so, and maybe I'll just editorialize that movie that I showed you just a small clip of. One of the best parts from, that I enjoyed as well was um, in the town of Dan Danville, there was a factory which made clothespins. So uh, one of the seniors kind of brought out this box of clothespins and was like, you should have pride in clothespins. It was, they were built here, or they were uh, manufactured here. Um, any other questions before we move on to the next part? But, okay, okay, well, anyway, we're, we're very flexible. Um, but you know, it's okay because you're gonna move on to the next part where they're gonna do some more writing down. Um, okay, so part of uh, what I do at Learn is I work with a nice team of people to develop uh, some learning templates uh, for teachers to help plan projects or planning projects. So uh, one, oh, it didn't turn out very well, but um, one of the things that I do a lot of is work with teachers to do something around called uh, community service learning. So community service learning is connected to um, the pedagogy, the ped pedagogical strategy of service learning, which is uh, working with young people to address an authentic need in the community while it's connected to the curriculum. 
So it's kind of based around this idea that um, st for student success to happen, students need to be engaged in learning. How are students engaged in learning? It's when they're addressing authentic needs uh, and issues in their community. And we are asking them to think about projects that they are interested in, things that they want to learn about that are connected to the curriculum. Um, so addressing an authentic need is one of the approaches that we've used so far. What we've been um, also doing, so in addition to looking at the needs, is looking at the assets. So there's this thing called asset mapping, and the gist of it is that you're looking at what's important. You guys named a lot of things that are important and valued in the community, and what you can do to make sure that they stay around for a long time. So those are two ways of looking at it. What is a need, and then what is an asset? And so what, we're, what we encourage the teachers to do is to get the students to figure out what is important to them, what's missing, what they want to hold on to, give them a chance to create a project and provide a service in the community. So one of the ways that we see this, and this, by the way, is what the French sector is really interested in looking at. They keep asking us about this is we've described it to them as l'élève citoyen. So it's the student as citizen. And we're giving them a chance to do that in a very authentic way where they're identifying what's important, what's needed. You will get the chance to do this as well. So, so before we uh, dive in, I, I'm going to just go through a few of the different sections. Um, we brought some well, they're available, they're bilingual, and as well there's other templates that kind of dive deeper into each section. And I want to say that um, they're available free on the Learn website. So uh, if you're interested, I'm, I can help direct you towards them. So um, up in the, we have the authentic needs, so what are the ways that students can investigate a real need? So it's a chance for you to think about um, ways that we could engage students in some of these questions, whether they're elementary or secondary students, or even adult ed education. Um, student voice, which is this notion of how can students um, have voice in the project, how can they make real decisions. So how do students have a strong voice in the project with guidance from adults? We have curriculum connections, uh, which are, you know, so what are some of the competencies that uh, students um, are here to develop? I, I realize um, not everyone here are teachers, but even just competencies in terms of like, these are the concrete skills we want young people to, um, to, to harness. Partnerships, and this is the, the piece that's most important for me in this room right now. What are the ways that students can identify individuals and organizations that can help? Um, so knowing that we have this room of uh, different people from different organizations, how can um, organizations and people outside of the school be part of this project to help teachers and students achieve uh, the great things? Um, and then just in the middle, a project at a glance. So what knowledge, skills, and attitudes do we want the students to experience in this project? And it's also just a good opportunity to, I used to say, like, this, the project in a nutshell. So if you want to just give, like, a very brief descri description. Um, and if you get there, there's also um, a timeline at the bottom. So um, are there any questions about this template? So what I want to do right now is um, kind of do, like, a rapid planning process. So um, you know, we discussed some really interesting ideas um, around how young people can investi investigate their history and heritage or what it means to be part of the English-speaking community. And I want to challenge us in the room, and I realize there's no tables here, so writing things down might be a, a little bit difficult, but um, without being burdened by the constraints of funding, of um, other details that can often stand in the way of us thinking big, um, I encourage you, I would love if you would kind of use the project planner as you see fit to um, develop a prototype project that you can get feedback on. And it's okay to be like very creative and think very outside of the box. So uh, what I would love if we took five or 10 minutes, uh, depending on, on how detailed people want to get. And just like, you know, if you talked about the family, the, um, the Christmas tree pro uh, project, if you want to talk about uh, how young people might want to use archives to develop their family history or family tree, 
um, like brainstorm a bit on the project and kind of flesh out as many ideas as possible. But like imagine if there was no constraints in the world. You had all the money you needed. If you had um, different partners in the community that were not constrained by funding um, or who could help you in different ways. I'd love if you could like give life to an idea um, and then we're gonna go do another step after that. So I, I'm, what I'm asking you to do is like it's a, it's a, I hope it's okay, but uh, I really would love to get some ideas around things that could potentially happen. Are there any questions about what I'm asking you to do at this moment? So this, this is a good question. So um, actually, when I originally conceived of this, I thought there was going to be tables, and I was gonna, there would be people sitting around tables. So I would, you're welcome to do it uh, with people who came up with a similar idea. I encourage you to move your chairs or make like a table using some of the books. Um, so you can do it individually, you can do it as a group. That, that's up to you. Any other questions? Um, You should feel free. You should feel free. Okay, so are you guys ready to do some active planning? Just like your teachers? Yes. Please go for it. Let's see what happens. If you have any questions or, or stuck, just uh, let me know. And please like make, make the space available. And you can also, if there are tables outside this room as well, if you want to use that table, go ahead. Um, just please come back. Okay, so um, uh, we're going to share the different projects that we, the ideas that we came up with. And uh, in, in when I was a teacher, I used to teach the students that it's important to give feedback sandwiches. So you may see yourself like, hey, what's a feedback sandwich? Um, a feedback sandwich is, well, just like a sandwich. You have the bread on top that you need to like say like, oh, I really liked your project because... And then the meat could be like, I think this project would be like, like better, or like you might want to think about like this. It doesn't need to be like delicious like the bread, uh, but a piece of feedback of, of how it could change, or a, a partner you might want to think about is this this person, this baloney. Um, and then we want to, of course, uh, surround that piece of meat with another piece of bread, which is like, but again, I really liked your project because I thought like the idea of doing this is so neat and important. So that's like kind of the, the spirit that I want people to, to offer feedback to each other is, is through a feedback sandwich. So um, I'd love if we could kind of quickly go, well not quickly, we could, if we kind of go around the room um, and people could share just a little bit about their project. You can either read um, it complete or you can kind of give like the, the short version, but uh, and then we can offer um, feedback to each other and then we'll go from there. Uh, any questions about uh, these delicious sandwiches we're going to give to each other? Great. Uh, do I have a volunteer to go first to share their project? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Carol. Did you know Carol is the executive director of an amazing organization called the Quebec Home and School Fe uh, Ho sorry, Federation of Home and School? Okay, so I'm going to elaborate on this idea of the, uh, the Christmas present. So the authentic need, what is the purpose of the project, is for children to understand about simple pleasures and the difference between want and need. Uh, student voice, how students participating in planning and decision making, well, they would decide who they're going to ask, be it a family member or a neighbor. Uh, students decide on the questions to lead to the relating of the whole story. Uh, so the project in a nutshell, children ask multi-generational members of their family or neighbors to share information, memories about a favorite or special Christmas present. Essays and photos will be collected and printed in a book or booklet and stories shared with fellow students. Curriculum connections, English language arts, creative writing, local history, culture over time. I don't know if that's a connection. Okay, and, and I'm ethics and culture. Partnerships, I guess, if not only their families, but perhaps senior centers. 
So the individuals could be sharing uh, treasured memories and giving themselves an opportunity to reflect on the past and perhaps express gratitude. Um, animators would be hired to go to speak to the classrooms about the project and give tips on how to do interviews. And a graphic artist would be a partner to develop the final format for uh, publishing uh, collection. I don't know if you want me to go into project timeline. Um, I'll share with other people. So now's our chance to give a feedback sandwich to Carol uh, about her project. So does anyone have a um, piece of bread and a piece of meat to share? Carol, I think that's an amazing idea. No surprise. Uh, I think that you are definitely on the right track when it comes to getting various people involved. And I just thought like it could be interesting as animators to maybe have students from a communications program in a university that might want to share some of their knowledge with the students and possibly even the graphic designer. And in some, they can help create that wonderful booklet you were talking about. Feedback sandwich. Who wants to go next? Oh, more feedback? Does anybody else have any feedback for Carol? Thank you. Um, a, a piece of feedback I want to give you uh, uh, is I also thought it was really great to have um, young people involved in the intergenerational project, talking to their seniors or others in the community. Um, I as you mentioned, like, oh, I wonder if that's part of the history curriculum. I was like, oh, I probably should have uh, talked to, looked up the competencies that came with the history uh, program in elementary and high school. So I very quickly went on my phone and was like, hey, I'm going to check real fast. So at least one of them is to construct his or her representation of space, time, and society. So it's the notion of like knowing uh, where they are in 2018 and what um, it was like 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, and how things have changed. So one thing that could be integrated, again, is just this notion of like how, how things have changed in Quebec. And so I guess I just want to say that like wholly connected to the curriculum, like could imagine teachers um, potentially want to take this on with a partner that, for example, Catherine mentioned. Great. Thank you very much. Do I have a volunteer to go next to share their project? <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So I ran, or we, we ran with the Underdogs of History project. Um, so, I mean, the need that we're addressing um, is one that comes up often in our in our projects, which is uh, basically to find a way to create pride in the community, um, and therefore to have the to have young people uh, personally invest so that they feel like they own a part of their community, and which of course will lead them to want to participate more and ultimately, hopefully, um, to stay within the region or to come back after they complete their education, which is a, something we struggle with consistently. So the project, uh, in a nutshell, is to, um, to sort of identify who are the underdogs of our local history and to, uh, to question this homogenous narrative that gets um, promoted most of the time. And I mean, you know, which community groups you know, we do that too, right? When we're doing our grant applications and things. Um, so w one of the student voice part of this would be what they, I guess, I don't know if it's student voice, but what we thought we could they could do is go through their own family tree and discover, you know, how, wha how do I think of my family tree? And then in exploring it, you know, where are there these little blips? Where are these uh, bits and pieces that don't fit into what I always thought was the way that it went. Um, and then to collaborate as a group to discover common themes and then to explore those themes as they arise um, th 
through archival research, through um, local storytellers and the stories that they tell of the past, and, uh, and that kind of thing. So uh, as I'm vocalizing this, I'm realizing it's not terribly clear. <laughs> but that's okay. And since, I was since we were dreaming big, um, I thought that the product that could be created at the end of this would be a museum exhibit. Um, and so the local partners would be um, like, first of all, local community members who are very knowledgeable about, uh, about stories, about um, how to do genealogical research, how to do uh, historical research, um, and as well, obviously, as the museum and any other community groups that, like the group that I represent, that would be helpful in, um, in sort of getting the ball rolling. And, and oh yes, and curriculum, curriculum connections. Um, we weren't too sure on <laughs> what the curriculum is like in schools, but I, I can only assume that there are history and social or cultural studies of some point at some sort in the high schools. And then also, um, you know, the writing and the artistic side of things, uh, photograph. Um, yes, I have a slide. <laughs> that was great. Uh, would anyone like to offer a feedback sandwich? Okay, I'll go first. Um, I thought this project was great because uh, as we kind of discussed on the side is that we um, it's a great opportunity to allow young people to learn about their ancestry and kind of uh, think about what stories are told, I mean this is my interpretation, what stories are told about our families and which are kind of like not as promoted um, or brought to the forefront and wouldn't it be interesting to talk about why? Um, a piece of meat that I'll give you which is um, as you may have heard I guess this morning even um, like a hot button topic is around the history curriculum in Quebec and that, like, my interpretation of what it is is because, uh, you know, in any kind of formal history, there's, like, what is the history in the textbook, and then what are all the stories, like, we don't necessarily know about, and one of the critiques are that minority uh, groups, like, don't have much opportunity. I see this as a really wonderful opportunity for local schools, uh, local teachers, and local communities to, like, to do that research themselves, and what the teacher would do, just create the space for that to happen. Um, which I think would address a lot of the critique that um, many people are saying exists. And so I think that's important that, because I believe we can't expect like the Ministry of Education to be like, here's the history of everybody, like, um, but what are the people, the opportunities for like ourselves as a linguistic minority, for example, to say like, this is something we want to talk about uh, and, and promote to other people perhaps, or other schools using Pelican grants. Um, okay, any other feedback? I just have a question, and um, I'm taking down some potential partners and putting them on the board, um, but you yourselves are a potential partner that we can then share with the school, and so maybe I can entice you to say a little bit about what, your, what you can bring as an organization or in your personal role, or it could be yourself as a community member, um, what you could bring to this project. Well, our, our organization has um, a history of doing projects that are, that are similar to this. Like many of the projects that you showed us before, we have done um, art projects that were designed to explore um, Anglophone history in the area. We called it Expressions of Gas Bay History. And, um, and we're doing something very similar right now, which is using art as a form of community mobilization. For not just for youth, but for anybody who, who cares to come. Um, so, so yeah, so we have, um, we have a good history of knowing how to enact something like this, um, as well as a good knowledge of who the key players are in the community that we could reach out to um, to develop a program like this. Thanks for sharing. Um, yes. For 
for me in the secretariat. Um, I could see, um, I mean, it's hard for the government to react in real time. But <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, finding, um, you know, institutional partners, um, uh, communicating, I mean, we, we work with different ministries, the Ministry of Education, um, sort of that kind of networking um, to find sources of funding might be something that we could help with. Um, and maybe even uh, intergovernmental. Uh, yes, and uh, we saw that there's a, the secretary started compiling that list, right? So we saw the numbers. I'm assuming there are names associated with those numbers of the organizations, or there will be in the future. So that could be a potential place to um, mine, so to speak, uh, potential partners. Someone? Yeah. So th this is partly a test to see if I really understand how to make a sandwich. Um, uh, so I, I uh, like the project because I think it leads uh, students in the direction of thinking about what group they are part of and the origins and some of the characteristics of that group. Um, uh, I want to suggest asking the question, uh, could there be uh, some underdogs who will still feel like they're underdogs when the story is told. Um, so the idea being that there, there are groups who feel underdogs for some other reasons which aren't gonna get addressed by this. And if you can get an answer to that question, then uh, you might have um, a uh, project about underdogs that all underdogs feel uh, is interesting for them. Okay, um, so the, the project in a nutshell uh, is that young people discover and help isolated seniors in a variety of contexts, English speaking seniors. And uh, the purpose of the project is to have an impact on isolation, to reduce isolation, social, well particularly social isolation uh, in the English-speaking community, in, in, in one's own English-speaking community. Um, how do students participate? Uh, they can interview seniors uh, to, to learn about their needs and interests. They can uh, talk to their own family members and neighbors about isolated seniors that they might know. Uh, they can uh, do an inventory of what exists in a given community that somehow would connect with isolated seniors. And they could even try to do an inventory of isolated seniors. Right? By definition, isolated seniors are isolated. So <laughs> you gotta ask, so where are they? Uh, <coughs> curriculum connections. So personally, I wasn't sure what curriculum we were talking about, but um, I'll tell you what's written here. I can read it. Uh, well, this is a sort of identification of different things that can be learned about by do uh, learned by doing this. Um, how to do outreach, how to investigate, how to document, how to present and share, uh, how to. How do you how to use find and something existing resources? How to, how to use and find and use existing resources? Uh, how to engage in collaboration? And how to make contact with people, particularly people who, by definition, may not be so happy that you're trying to do that. Uh, I don't know if that fits. I don't know what curriculum <laughs> we're talking about, so I don't know if that fits with it. And um, partnerships, uh, what partners can give and receive, uh, community organizations and public institutions, which may also have an interest in isolated seniors, and which have resources and which may have a, some kind of a mandate about this. Uh, adult volunteers who are interested in the same issue. Um, uh, 
So I have trouble reading some of the words in the next, but I think it boils down to an elaboration of the same thing, uh, making partnership with other, pe other groups who have an interest in the same subject and maybe resources to act on it. Is that sarcasm? Or? No. <laughs> no, not at all. It was a great description. Um, and I'll, I won't, I'll give you my sandwich in a second, but I won't first want to say, does anyone else, does anyone have a feedback sandwich they wish to offer? I, I just have a piece of bread to offer, and that's, I love this idea of, of actually creating a resource, so creating that inventory. That was, that was really great, thank you. And that's, that's something that you can do. If a resource does not exist, create it. My sandwich I want to give is, I also thought, a wonderful project which addresses an authentic need, which is supporting the seniors in our community. Um, and this is something that we've seen around the community learning cent center network in like isolated pockets. But this idea of making it more um, holistic or network wide, I think is really, really important. Um, and a piece of meat is just like, like yes, I, I, I personally believe this is like the time is now for young people to be active citizens and to kind of make relationships with seniors who have like brought, brought us, I mean, when, we are all young and we all kind of move along our timeline and to kind of make sure that there's those connections because um, it is easy to become isolated and I think um, it is the, a role of the school and our communities to kind of make sure there's those connections. A very smart, smart that's a very smart story, a very small story, which is smart, is uh, Quebec High School and another, a number of other schools have been doing something called uh, like Internet 101 where seniors have expressed um, uh, the need for support to know how to use like their iPads or their computers to like talk to their family who have like moved to Alberta or whatever. So it's these leadership classes in high schools or grade six who have started to kind of have these these um, these workshops with seniors to help them in any way that they need. Uh, and the feedback is like two ways where the students get to f like experience that pride of helping somebody, and the seniors are like, oh, so nice to like talk to young people and have them share with me, but also have those interactions. Um, so, to go off your idea, like, how can we build more of a network so it's not just teachers who have to put it all on their shoulders, but community organizations who want to support that as well. That's my hunk of sandwich. Uh, any other pieces of feedback? Okay, we're, all, we're almost getting, we're getting near the, the, the end. The end. Uh, anyone else like to share their, their idea? Scott. I'm right on the next one. <laughs> um, <coughs> What I did, I kind of fused uh, two ideas that I had. So I wanted to uh, pitch making an interactive website portraying local history through various media. So uh, various scanned documents, uh, photos, video, audio interviews, and have collaboration on that project where possible between students in English and French speaking schools and even uh, including uh, indigenous students if uh, the population's there. And this is something that you could do over and over uh, the years, like um, say each, uh, each year, the, each class that comes in each year could add a component to it. So it's something that uh, could be curated and built upon. Uh, in terms of the purpose of the project, uh, it could, cover uh, cross-cultural understanding, so different uh, communities getting to know how the other side sees themselves and their relationships with the other. Uh, creation of a sense of a connection to uh, a, ver a certain locality and Quebec society as a whole. I have to say that um, at y for y Quebec, we did a gap analysis, and it's available on our website, but one of the things, one of the big, big things that came up was Although youth um, ages 16 to 30 in Quebec felt a, a connection to their local area, there, I believe 80% said they had little or no co connection to Quebec. They felt no connection to the province. So that's something that's sorely lacking, and it's uh, one out of many contributors to emigration. And another uh, purpose of the project would be to foster uh, second language skill development. Uh, looking at student voice, it depends on like what level you're going to have the kids do this, so whether it's um, 
elementary or secondary and beyond. So uh, you could have uh, people from uh, IT, uh, historians, sociologists come in and work with the students and uh, kind of frame, you know, the frame, how, how involved uh, these experts would be in framing the parameters of what they'd be doing, uh, you know, would depend on the age and skill set of the students. Um, but the students themselves would select items for inclusion and would they be involved uh, to varying extents in constructing a narrative to connect all of the items on the site. Uh, curriculum connections, I wasn't too sure about this, so I just went very vague in general. So I thought language skills, uh, narrative and composition skills, research skills, teamwork, and historical knowledge, because they can then compare their own local history and see how it pairs up or contrasts even with that of Quebec as a whole. Uh, partnerships, uh, I thought what, um, partners could give would be IT skills, research skills, et cetera, access to resources. And I thought uh, partners could also receive new knowledge uh, that would come out of this project. So, yes. Yeah. Any feedback for Scott? Piece of bread, some meat. Network because they have something called Mapping the Mosaic, which uh, originally was just for mapping areas in the island of Montreal that had significance to English communities, but they were intending, and I think they have, to expand it Montreal area and beyond. So any small community could do the same and plant their little map there. Yeah. Mapping the Mosaic? Yeah, and, and oh, I kind of build off that comment as well because I'm now remembering, I believe Quan, the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network, developed something called like 100 Objects. Yeah. And, yeah, show me. So, and I guess my comment around that is that other organizations that have kind of come before us have like put all this work and energy in. I guess it, it is a project in, in the sense that there was like a beginning and an end. But I wonder how we, as people who are like continuing in this conversation can like, take what they've done and s what I liked about Scott's project is like this iterative idea of like every year we grow a little bit more and more um, versus like what do they say like one and done you know and that this is something that we want to keep going so I thought that was that was really interesting great as well any other comments on that um, anyone else have a project to share Oh, so are we, is it actually till three o'clock? I don't know. Anyway, in any case, um, I'm like this is the wrap up now. So I want to say um, thank you very much for participating. I hope uh, this idea of like project uh, brainstorming or generation of ideas was um, interesting to you. Uh, my hope is that like some I some seeds have been planted. Some networking has happened. Uh, definitely speaking for myself over the last two or three days, there's a lot of, it's been interesting to be around people who are also interested in like the English speaking community. And, um, and uh, we can go and grow from there. Yes. Good. You can, you can, say, you can say the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, y this is so it's recorded. Yeah, uh, just to say I like the format because it made people move around, talk, do things. Uh, there was more than one thing. And in the afternoon, I wasn't here for the other days, but I was on the third day, energy flagged. So, <laughs> well done. Um, yes, uh, we work with Carol Minda. We work with uh, Seniors Action, Vision Gaspé at Canadian Heritage Youth for Youth. And... Um, you all know that we have a call date for project funding in November. So if any of these projects can be developed in a way that could uh, fit in the call date for, you know, don't hesitate to call the Montreal office and to discuss how to implement uh, such projects could be 
through this fund. It could be through, uh, if it's linked to Heritage, also the Community Cultural Action Fund next April. So keep on developing those ideas and, and sharing ideas with other partners and uh, don't hesitate to call the office for, for funding. Yeah, and, and this is one thing I'll, I'll, I'll say to teachers that I work with, is that you know, if you ever have questions about grants or anything, like you should call the office, because there's probably a very nice person sitting in a cubicle, like wait, this is for myself at least, like sitting in the cubicle like waiting to talk to somebody and g help them get money. So, is that comment or like I'm in a cubicle? Okay, so, but, but this is it, right? We like send emails and, it, and we like, let's go back to the 1980s and pick up the phone. Um, so I, I'll say thank you again. Um, this is what like we a lot of my job. What I do is like help facilitate these types of discussions. Usually it's with teachers, which is why there was curriculum connections. But my hope and dream is like they work with people like yourself to develop awesome, engaging, and authentic projects for young people to learn to be active citizens, as Catherine um, pointed out. I'm gonna let Catherine say thank you as well. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and I would invite you to definitely get into, send us an email. Send us an email. We have these like fancy signatures that we recently added to our emails where you can do all the things like the LinkedIn, all the social media, the book faces and all those things. Uh, and you can sign up to the newsletter as well, all that fancy things. But really, if you just send me an email saying, I was at, the, I was at your workshop, I'll just keep you in the loop. So when things come around, what, what, um, what we like to do, and what I particularly like to do, is think about, oh, if someone from, say, one of the, the schools, the CLC network, says, I'm working on this project, or we were thinking of doing that, if you're interested, we'll connect you. Like, we, we are the, um, we usually have a, a little image up. So we tend to be the person that puts the, the plugs together, like this. And that lights the Christmas lights, the Christmas lights, the Christmas tree. Um, so please feel free. And we, you can also pick up the phone and call us. You'll get our phone numbers once you send us an email when we write back. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to accost us before uh, we head out the door. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. We're, we're sticking around. Bye.